So good evening, everyone. As Andrea mentioned, I'm Aaron Hammond. Uh, I'm an executive member. Okay. You're going to change the things for me? Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Don't forget your job. So uh, I'm an executive member, occasional candidate, uh, pilot, and first principles engineer. Uh, so you may not have heard about first principle engineering before, but I think it's something that a lot of the party can resonate with. Um, so it's something that's not really defined by what you do, but how you go about doing it. And I think taking a detour to talk about that for a moment will help. So let's discuss it with a, a short example. So here's a straightforward question. If a two slice toaster takes two minutes to toast two slices of bread, how long does it take to toast three slices? And depending on how much thought you've put into it, you get a few different answers. So the intuitive answer, two slices takes two minutes, so three slices will take three minutes. Uh, but the more thoughtful among you will recognize that you can only put two slices in at a time. So the answer should be four minutes. Those people, of course, are wrong. The correct answer is actually three minutes, but you have to swap out two of the slices after a minute to keep both of the slots occupied. And then there's the software engineer's answer who claims to have an infinite amount of toasters and can cook any amount of toast in two minutes. But anyway, so this is something I think the science party does really well. We often say it's important to ask the right questions. And that includes questioning the assumptions that we've made before we even get to the decision table. So let's talk about wind energy. How do you build a windmill? Here's an everyday wind turbine creating renewable energy to stop the world from burning and from excessive greenhouse gas emissions. There's not really too much to them really. We can see here the blades to catch the wind, the generator to turn the wind into electricity, some aerodynamic features in the hub and the nacelle, the tower to hold it up and the foundation to hold everything in place. It works because the windmill's distinguishing feature, the blades, uh, are airfoils. So they create lift as they move through the air, which is also moving. And here's the lift equation. It tells you what's important when building a wind turbine. It says the lift depends on C sub L, the coefficient of lift, which is just telling us that it, we get more lift if the blade looks more like a wing. And then there's that P looking thing that's called rho, which is the density of air. And we can't do much to change that. On the right, there's the S term at the end, which is the area. So bigger means better. And then there's that velocity squared term, which includes a few things. Uh, one is the speed of the wind, which we can't do much about again, other than to try to be where it's windy. And the other is the speed of the airfoil. And so you can imagine that when the blades are spinning, the red bits at the tips are whipping around at incredible speeds, while the bits closest to the hub are barely moving. So the bits of the tips are doing most of the work and the bits near the center is mainly structural. So to summarize, to build a, build a windmill, we want to connect a generator to a big wing looking thing that's moving very quickly and put it somewhere windy. Now, to power the nation, we need to build lots of these as big as we can and put them on the tops of hills or somewhere else high where the wind is stronger. And although these are relatively cheap already, making them cheaper would increase uptake and speed up our movement to a lower carbon environment. So the question becomes, how do we build windmills more cheaply? And this is where first principles engineering comes in. This question is perfectly reasonable. And there are thousands of researchers working on this problem, each of which may come up with one sort of correct answer. But that's not necessarily the best question. All we are really trying to do is create renewable energy. And we know that there's energy in the wind that we can extract. A different question might be, how do we create a cheaper system to extract energy from the wind? Notice that this question doesn't presume an answer. So looking at the lift equation again, we can see what's important and we might be able to deduce what's not important. So since we're trying to save money, you might ask if we can save costs in the tower and foundation. 
they won't even mentioned in the lift equation. But if you do, a specialist civil engineer might quickly tell you, we need the strong tower to get the blades high into the upper airstream. Yeah, the foundation is incredibly important. It provides stability by applying a counteracting torque to the system. But they're still working with the first question. They've been making assumptions, but all we really need to, is a blade to catch the wind and mechanisms to turn that into electricity. Now, long ago, we figured out a different way of getting things into the sky. I bet even your five-year-old self knew about it. It's called a kite. And if only we had a big thing that looked like a wing, perhaps a wing. And there you have it. Attach a wing to a string and connect it to a thing and you can generate electricity. Uh, so this guy is one of Kite Mill's prototypes. They're one of the handful of companies working on what's called airborne wind energy, uh, probably because it has an awesome acronym. Uh, so this is what a wind will, windmill would look like if you deleted most of the unnecessary parts from the system. Uh, so the foundation can be smaller, the tower's gone, most of the blade's gone. So they just focus on where the tips of the blade would have been and get rid of the slower moving central section. And because they don't have to build a tower, there are massive savings in construction costs. And not only that, they can fly their turbine at higher and higher altitudes where the wind is faster and the energy is collected is greater. And I, I say they deleted almost all of the unnecessary components, but they've also added some that weren't present before. So here you can see that they've added some bits to a normal aircraft. Uh, you've got the elevator and vertical stabilizer at the tail and the back, uh, some sort of fuselage thing, and some quadcopter propellers. Of course, you need those propellers because everyone knows that the only way to get a kite to fly is with a quadcopter VTOL setup. And as any aeronautical engineer will tell you, the tail is incredibly important. It provides stability by applying a counteracting torque to the system. So you might gather from the tone of my voice, um, I, I don't think this is the optimal solution. Um, and while they're working on around some problems, they've introduced a new one of their own. But saying that, I really think airborne wind energy is a great solution in general. And with more research, they'll become even more efficient. Uh, so I've been tinkering around with these in my free time, uh, trying to solve some of those problems and to improve manufacturability. Uh, and I'm by no means the only one. So here are some of the different implementations of similar concepts. Uh, we've got uh, Kite Mill and Ampix. Uh, so they're the same sort as I sort of explained before. They take a big glider in the sky with a tether connected to a generator on the ground and that spools in and and out to uh, create power. So you, you fly the kite in spirals and the, in the strong part of the wind to create energy and then eventually the tether will run out and you reel it back in in a configuration that doesn't use as much energy. So in this image, the wind is blowing from the left and in blue you can see the kite flying in spirals and in a high angle of attack. Uh, so high angle of attack means more of the surface gets hit by the oncoming wind, and that means more lift. Uh, more lift means more tension in the cable, and tension in the cable is used to turn a generator, and that makes the electricity. Uh, I think it's important to point out again that all of this energy is being generated on the ground. So all the glider is there for is to pull on that cable to um, that's connected to a spool on the generator, and that, that's uh, what generates the electricity. But at some point after it's pulled backwards for a while, you, you run out of cable. But not to worry, a very long time ago, we realized that generators can be used in reverse as a motor. So we can just reel in the kite and start the spirals again. So it will use energy to reel the kite back in, but as you can see in red, uh, the wing is flattened out and it's flown straight in towards the generator. So that drag is minimal and we don't lose as much energy in the process. So on average, the energy generated is positive. So I really think this type of turbine is the correct answer as far as making big wind energy goes. 
but there are other uh, other answers too. Uh, up until recently, Google was investing in a project called Makani, whose system seems at the outside to be a little more straightforward. Um, so they simply got rid of the tower and they used the kite to loft the spinning generators into the sky and send the electricity straight back down the cable. So you can see on this one, I think they've got four, but they, they bumped that up to eight propellers that would generate electricity in the sky. Um, so I've never been a big fan of this solution uh, because generating lift for energy and carrying the generators and power cables loses you a lot of uh, efficiency. And it seems like Google agrees with me because they've recently wound up operations. Um, they have, however, generously open sourced all the data, code, tools and patents. So we could see other companies pick up the ball and run with the idea soon. Another similar architecture is this Alturus uh, setup, who do a similar thing, but rather than using a kite to lift the generators, they use a lighter than air balloon. So you can see some of the benefits to both of these ideas. Uh, putting the generator on the ground allows more efficiency because you don't have to carry as much, but winding in the cable and out again necessarily means that the power is intermittent. Uh, and there are other solutions to that problem, such as battery storage or multiple kites. That, so um, you have a few generating while others are attracting. Uh, but lifting the generator gets around all that problem by just being able to continuously generate power and sending that straight to the ground. Or you could combine both strategies, um, as shown here. It's a bit hard to see, um, but you might be able to make out a green kite high in the sky holding up this propeller mechanism and then a, power, a pair of cables which uh, go to a ground-based generator. So those two cables are actually a loop, which allows them to send the kinetic energy down to the ground station where the generator converts some motion into energy without needing to reel the whole assembly in and out. It, it just reels in and out uh, continuously. Uh, and if you're particularly keen, you can have one of these of your own right now. Uh, this company is in France called Kitewinder, and they'll sell you a kit for around a thousand bucks, which can generate 0 0.1 kilowatts of power. Or just to give you a bit of perspective, that's uh, half the output of a $200 solar panel for a thousand dollars. But uh, this is fairly new technology, and it can only improve over time. So my aim tonight wasn't necessarily to convince you that the solution to all our energy problems is airborne wind energy, although it, it might be. Um, my aim was to demonstrate that if you approach problems with creativity and curiosity, you might find there are ways to avoid the problem entirely. You might end up with four new different problems, but each one we solve just gets us further towards the goal. So. The next time you're struggling to find a better answer to a question, just ask yourself, can I ask a better question? And with that, I'll allow anybody interested to ask any questions they may have. Thanks. Awesome. Thanks for that, Aaron.